All right, everybody, what's going on? It's Saturday night. The kid is staying with her grandparents tonight. So I got some free time. Let's see. Just that a little bit. So tonight we're going to have a little watch along. Uh, There's always vanilla, 1971. Uh, George Romero's uh, second film after Night of the Living Dead and the film he made previous to uh, Jack's Wife, Season of the Witch. Uh, this movie was written by uh, Richard Ritchie, uh, directed by George Romero, and it's a movie that George Romero uh, wasn't the biggest fan of uh, for many, many years. Uh, if you go back to the, uh, the Anchor Bay DVD release <clears throat> that they did with uh, the two-pack with uh, Season of the Witch, um, the interview that they had with George on there, George was not really that big of a fan, didn't pretty much outright said that didn't care about the movie, didn't think about it too much. Uh, but I believe in, in years um, after the fact, uh, George um, went back, took a look at it, and I think he, he had a little bit more of an appreciation for it uh, after watching it, um, you know, not too, not too long before he passed away. Um, but it's one of my uh, personal favorites of his. Uh, it's a really weird movie. It's pretty much unlike anything else that he's uh, ever done. Um, he didn't really look at it as his film, but if you watch it, uh, especially with uh, some of the actors that are in it, uh, which we'll point out while we're watching it tonight, um, you see a lot of George in this in this movie. And to me, it's it's George's love letter um, to the city of Pittsburgh. Um, if you visit Pittsburgh, you, you'll you'll see what I'm talking about uh, after you watch this film. Um, so tonight, bottle of wine, uh, courtesy of Josh. Thank you, Josh. Who the hell that is? Um, so we're gonna drink uh, drink a little wine, watch a little of uh, George A. Romero's. There's always vanilla, and uh, let me get it queued up here, and uh, we'll just go ahead and jump into this puppy. And three. Two, if you want to watch along at home, I'll do a countdown and blah, blah, blah. Uh, three, two, one, and play. This is a film from the Layton Image Incorporated. I'm not sure what this song is. Um... Fairly haunting. It's up there. I got a, a poster for the affair up above me. So if I if you look if you catch me looking up here, trying to trying to find information and stuff I don't know. That's what I'm doing. Everything's so confusing. Everything's going round and round. Ray Lane. And, and 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 we have to have caused that, and then we can't understand it. What do you think of the machine? That looks marvelous. Do you think it means anything? Well, of course. What do you think made it? Of course, you'll recognize a lot of these voices here. Uh, George himself. Uh, and we'll definitely hear Jack Russo here in a second. Very uh, unmistakable voice. I think they're trying to make fun of us. Some college kids made us, and they're trying to say that our society screwed up. That's just, <laughs> there's Jack right there. I really tried to make understand. Hi, what do you think of the machine? Well, I like it. I really think that it's more or less what this country needs. I think that uh, more time was put into things like this, things that make people happy, things that make people want to get out. And that's Bill Heinzman, like of I course, Cemetery Zombie from Night of the Living Dead, Vince Stravinsky, uh, <laughs> George Cassana, Sheriff, Al Croft, uh, a lot of familiar names from Night of the Living Dead. They pretty much started filming this not too long after they uh, released it, Night of the Living Dead, the 68. So I think they started this somewhere around probably late 69, 70. The credits on this are always, have always, <laughs> always been interesting to me, the way that they're laid out. It's like this is a film directed by George A. Romero instead of, you know, the usual. It's pretty cool. I don't know if this was a, that was a thing they did a lot back at this time, not a expert on late 60s early 70s romantic uh, dramas but a cabinet in it so i open up the shower stall door and sure as shit there's a smiling cabinet in there 
What do you think of the machine? Oh, it's beautiful. But what does it do? I could never get the chick to appreciate anything like that. I should have stayed with what I was into. Playing the guitar is fish. The money was good. And I became a drag, too. Listen to myself on other people's records. It's very 60s psychedelic music. Barefoot in Athens. Don't know too much about them. Guess Joanna Lawrence. Was also did the music on this. Did a song on this. Gary Streiner. Good guy. Met him a couple of times. Super nice guy. This always reminded me of the uh, opening to Argento's Four Flies on Grey Velvet. Just that weird early 70s psychedelic rock. That movie actually has one of my favorite shots ever in it. Inside the, the guitar. The pit. No, I'm just rambling now. Let's go back to the Besides, I think I'm going deaf. What? All this noise, man. It's driving me crazy. I can't hear you. My brain. I've lost the ability to think. I think the sound is destroying my brain. Yo, what? Brain, man. For Christ's sake, Fox, the thing you have inside your head. Brain. I'm a little deaf in one ear. What do you attribute that to? Here's Jack Russo. Co-writer of Not a Living Dead. Wrote the original uh, story and screenplay for Return of the Living Dead. Done a lot of things. A lot of books. Good guy, too. Now, for those of you that don't know the history to this movie, this originally, I believe, was like a 30-minute... Uh, it's like a, I think a 30 minute or so, uh, like, uh, like test reel for Ray Lane. I guess he was trying to make it big in Hollywood and he was a really good actor. I wish I would have seen him, uh, seen him where he passed away years ago, but I'd love to have seen more, uh, more work with him and George and I. I want to say, I guess everybody's. If I'm, if I'm not 100 percent sure, but if I'm not mistaken, I think he was originally um, slated to play Roger in Dawn of the Dead. So when you see this guy Ray Lane, imagine him in the role of Roger. Uh, this is real early in the, uh, in the in the Dawn of the Dead pre-production, of course, but interesting. And of course, you'll recognize the director of this commercial here in a second. Bold gold. It's Richard Ritchie. The Rev, I believe they that he was known by. Oh, Judith Striner. <clears throat> Still never met her. Hmm? What? Thing? How do you do it? Is something wrong? Wrong? No, it's beautiful. It's a, it's a thing. Do it again. What? No. And of course, George and company were making a lot of commercials around this time in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, their company, The Latent Image, so. Oh, I, I don't smoke. It's kind of art imitating life here. Or art imitating life, imitating art. I don't know. It's... Isn't that cheating? Cheating. Yeah, it's making the beer look better than it actually looks. 
you're it's a great line here. here talking to me because of that beer. I'm standing here talking to you because of that beer, and everybody that's in this room is in this room because of that beer. All of our salaries, our very existence depends on that beer, and we're all here to make that beer look as good as we possibly can. Okay, come on, everyone, quickly, places, please. It's great. That's it. What? Beautiful. The mouth thing. That cheating? Look, Mr. Dorian, you want to take a look at this shop? Yes, I would. Okay, then. Great. Here's Johnny. <laughs> Russ Triner himself. To pay the See you later. Oh, look over here, Georgie. This is very nice. Coming in on the table. We'll catch it wild later. Very nice. <laughs> I like this accent that he's got going on in here, too. Well, here's what's going to happen. We're pulling off of your kiss, right? You're looking into her eyes. The announcer is going to say the beer for the man who thinks bold and acts bold. So pull off the kiss. Look at her, tell her something bold. Okay? Oh, you want, you want me to talk? talk? Of course you talk. People generally talk to one another. You're getting involved with one another. Sounds so like Howard Stern or something. Uh, places, background people, this isn't sound. You won't be heard. Okay, well, just tell her she's a frumpy little chick with all her brains in her ass. Just keep the mood, all right? Get involved, okay? We're going to roll. Okay, let me see the kiss. Yeah. Close, you're tender, involved, kissing, background people happy. Come on in the background, more beer. Beer, kissing, he's rolling, he's rolling, he's rolling, okay? He's rolling, we're rolling, everyone is happy. You bring the light a little. Good action. Get a frumpy little chick with your brains in your ass. You have a piece of spinach in your teeth. Tap. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Just a matter of timing. I didn't have anything in mind. It's just that my thing and the chick's thing came together at the same time. <laughs> that looks like Fort Pitt Boulevard. And now the stuff like this is where you really see what I was talking about. This being kind of a a love letter to Pittsburgh, the city. I'm not sure where this uh, bar is at. I know the. Roger McGovern played a uh, zombie in Night of the Living Dead. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, look what you've done to my suit. I'm a board meeting this afternoon. Three years, Dad. You're still here. Still here, still at this table. Shot in a beer for three years. Screw it, Bill. What? Screw that goddamn tie. This is my son, Chris. I haven't seen him for three years. <laughs> How are you? I'll call you tomorrow after I've had a chance to look over these layouts, okay? Business is getting full of faggots. Chris, you're not turning into a faggot, are you? You haven't changed a bit. Shirley, Sean, a beer for my boy here. <clears throat> what are you doing like this? That would never be a piece of dialogue you would hear today uh -huh. on any well, movie. Your, mother. your mother's out of her mind. Uh, is this you know what name she called out in her sleep the other night? Fidel Castro. <laughs> Chris, why don't you let me send you back to school? I might as well put my money to some good. No thanks, Dad. I don't want to hold back my education. You better come down out of those clouds, boy. Or you're not going to be worth the power to blow you to hell. You know, I truly believe that someday the whole world is going to go out like that. But if it's ever going to be saved, it's the, uh, it's the communications people who are going to do it. I like to, uh, I like to put it this way. It's not important to build skyscrapers and highways. What's really important is building bridges. Bridges between people. This character is incredibly corny and creepy. <laughs> I don't know what else to call it. 
He's like every douchebag that you see at a bar in your early 20s. Why people dancing back in the day was always interesting to me. Around this time, late 60s, early 70s, the universal white people go-go dance. Your old man can still cut the mustard. Cut the mustard. Personified in uh, Cassavetti's faces. You don't know your old man. Listen, I could, I could tell stories beginning right now to go from now until tomorrow. Where are you going, Chris? Son of a bitch. Where's Terry? She quit. Where the hell you been? Hey, where the hell you been? I haven't seen you in a couple of years, Sam. Jag off. Hey, who's that? It's my father. He can still cut the mustard. Oh, yeah? Hey. I can't sit with the customers unless the customers buy me a drink. Bloody Mary. <clears throat> oh my god. Hi, Potsy. How's every little thing? <laughs> Dude, act like he hasn't had attention from women in years. There's Bill Heinzman. Cemetery zombie. It's <laughs> also the uh, cinematographer for uh, the crazies. Met him years ago. Super cool. He was in a full zombie makeup. 2008 Texas Frightmare Weekend. Fortunately, he's passed away a few years ago. so long I was just getting ready to call the police. Yeah, well, well, I kind of got lost along the way. Yeah, but did you get the groceries? Yeah, I got the groceries, but they spoiled on the way. And then the next thing I knew, I took a wrong turn, and pretty soon I was like, It's funny, you know, growing up, you know, in your 20s, you knew a lot of a lot of guys like this guy here. Here is a classic example of the pot putting a bad mouth on the kettle. Most of them were good friends of mine. I like the cutting there. Now a lot of this like overlay, uh, like this stuff here. A lot of this was just added to kind of piece all of this stuff together. Because eventually they took that thirty-minute uh, like test uh, screen test or whatever you want to call it for Ray Lane and just kind of expanded it into this hour and a half long movie. Um, and George always spoke really highly of the original, like, 30-minute, uh, you know. I think commercials tend to break down communications rather than build them up. <laughs> that would have been really interesting. I don't know if that's hidden somewhere in the, you know, in the archives or, or what, but it's probably long gone, lost forever. Um, that would have been something interesting to see what that original, uh, what that original thing would be and what that was like. Every night. That for just one brief minute, 60 bubbly seconds, the guy can, can sit back and relax. Man, I never got to meet uh, Richard Ritchie. 
I wish I would have. He passed away a few years ago. But from everything I've heard, all the stories, um, sounds like a super interesting guy. Super sweet guy, too. Of course, his brother, Rudy. Most people probably remember from Dawn of the Dead as the... Uh, yeah. The leader of the bike gang. There's three of us. Yeah, that guy. You just fucked up real bad. My son is setting a bad example for his boys. Get it? My son's setting a bad example for me. I just love the fashion and the, the look of everything in this time period. I don't know why. It's almost as though I were expecting you. Bradley's Comet <laughs> appears in the western skies every couple of years. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't give a damn if they're artificially inseminated, or they have robots for mothers, or whether they're made of computers that come out of a test tube. I don't give a damn if their little bare asses have made Japan stamped on it. McGovern's so great in this. You buy that this dude is <laughs> drunk off his ass. Made of plastic. Those little plastic babies are gonna have mouths and are gonna be eating Bradley's baby. You realize what it looks like. Baby food. You realize what it looks like. Only now you're bringing your own theater party. <laughs> I'm glad that these, you know, this, Season of the Witch, Crazies, uh, The Amusement Park, just came out not long ago, finally, after years and years and years of pretty much nobody even knowing that it existed. The good thing about all these getting reissued and re-released and, you know, remastered and, and all that, I mean, first time I saw this, I mean, this along with Jax, I mean, if you watch those uh, on VHS, which I have a few... This is the original version of Season of the Witch that, uh, that I remember watching. And I remember just I couldn't get through it just because of just the quality of it. I mean, the pick quality, the sound quality was just so bad you couldn't hardly get through it. But once it came back out years later on the, uh, the two-sided DVD, uh, which was, you know, not not the greatest, but it was definitely better than, than this release. Um I liked it a little more. I think these movies get better um, the better that they're remastered, the better that they're, uh, you know, upgraded. Um, because by the time the, uh, you know, Between Night and Dawn uh, collection came out, I mean, those Blu-rays are, are beautiful. And you really, you can actually see what, uh, what the true intentions of the film were uh, originally. You could hear the dialogue better, you're... The picture's more, you know, it's not as distracting. If you know, it's a lot of the grain and stuff like that, which some of that is nice, you know. I don't mind it, but definitely with movies like this that are heavy on the dialogue, heavy on story, uh, it definitely helps being able to understand what people are saying and actually be able to hear the sound. Michael, so. so the more I watch these. The better quality they get, the more I like, the more I appreciate them. Especially Season of the Witch, which I think has some of George's, uh, the best dialogue George has ever written um, in that uh, in that film. <clears throat> now George didn't do the dialogue for this film. This is that guy, uh, Richie Rich, uh, Richard Richie. Sleeping bags in the desert. Yeah. Would you dig a magical trip to a mountaintop somewhere? 
I mean, just say the word. I can arrange it. Which you can kind of tell if you know if you've seen you know George's style in terms of dialogue. It's a very different type of dialogue in this film. Much more. Uh, okay. Get lost. You can definitely tell it's coming from his brain and not George's. I'm not explaining. I'm just rambling now. I'm almost a glass of wine in, so by the time this uh, this movie's over and this stream is done, I might not make any sense at all. So <clears throat> enjoy this while you can. Help yourself. Help yourself. Help yourself. Help yourself. Here. Help yourself. You know what your problem is, Terry. You give people the impression that you're an easy lay. <laughs> <laughs> she shines in her performance. She has that available look that makes every man think he can have her. <laughs> this movie's... It's kind of sad. All of these characters are, are just really are tragic in some way. Where's the kid? There's almost like a hopelessness to it. Even when, you know, Ray Lane's character and uh, and Judith Ridley's character get together, there's still... It's almost like there's a dark cloud hanging over everybody in this in this film. He's across the hall with the neighbors. Big reveal. Wake me up when I can use my bed, will you? Terry. Oh, better yet, just let me sleep it off here. Terry. Oh, now look. We're not going to talk about anything we haven't talked about before, right? Okay, now, do you want to screw? You want to kick my ass? Okay. <clears throat> you know where this little is. If you're not here when I wake up, see you again in another couple of years. Spend your whole life running away from your past. Why can't we always wind up back here? We're in the goddamn middle of it. Dogs barking. Daddy. That's, That's your papa. That's your papa. So you're a father, huh? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Well, I think she's lying. I don't think it's my kid. She could sue you. No, it's kind of shitty for her to do, I guess. It's also shitty for him not to uh, take care of his responsibilities. That sounds obscene. And if the court found that you were really the father, which it probably would, you'd have to go on supporting that child until it was able to take care of itself. This is pre uh, Mari Povich, too. Now this location here, um, I know um, Larry Vincent has found it. I've actually tried looking for it. It's kind of, from what I've seen, it's pretty out of the way, hard to find. But it's just such an interesting location. I mean, it's the platform, it's not a train station or whatever anymore, but the platform and all that's still there. There's still like a... Um, just like a phone booth and stuff. The actual uh, turnstiles there are still still there. Um, 
But yeah, that, that's definitely a location I'd like to track down at some point. Um, it's just a weird location. Here we go. Here's the turning point in the film coming up. Sudden boom, there she was, and I couldn't turn around and walk away from it. I'm sorry. You all right? Are you all right? Yeah, that phone booth back there behind her and that shot, I think, is still there. Say, girl, you know you almost killed me. I'm sorry. Miss Train. Well, what's more important, catching the train or a human life? My life. Catching the train. This one's very good. Sorry if that cling this one, uh, hit a little, little too loud. Kind of oh, this is very bad for you. Very bad for you. It's un very unflattering. Everyone has just raved about those photos. Your friends, right? Mm hmm. They're just lying to you. They're trying to be kind. Uh, what were you late for? An audition. An audition for a commercial. Television commercial? Yes. Television commercial for what? <coughs> Mason's. Mason's what? <clears throat> Toilet bowl cleaner. You're kidding me. You mean I got laid out because of somebody's toilet bowl cleaner? I'm not kidding. I would have had the job, too. Mm. Ten commercial. Do you realize how much money that is? I have to get there. That's pretty heavy. You know, you are never going to make it on TV. What? Your butt's too big. What? Your ass. Uh -uh, don't get me wrong, I kind of like it, but it's uh, really too big for television. <laughs> Come on, my Jeep is right out there. I'll give you a ride. Apologize first. You want a ride? I don't know about the <clears throat> chemistry between these two. I think as the movie goes on, it gets a little better, but that scene right there always says, nah, it didn't sit right with me, I don't know. Yeah. Very familiar sights if, you, uh, if you've ever visited Pittsburgh. That's downtown. toilet bowls in the world just a little bit cleaner. Shut up. <laughs> oh, is that any way to talk to somebody who's just giving you a ride? Did you really mean what you said about my... About your what? Hmm? Hmm? About your what? <laughs> well, I haven't eaten in 48 hours. I've got to go get something to eat. I want an apology. An apology? Girl, with your figure, your father must be the producer of that commercial. My father is Lyle Harris. And who's that? The news commentator, Lyle Harris. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that big bag of hot air. I should have realized the daughter of his would be all screwed up. He's all screwed up. You can't talk to me like You can't talk about my father like that. This is the worst pickup line in there. I don't even know what you'd call this. Talk to me like that. You Recording. Can't pick a girl up off the street and tell her her father's a bag of hot air and that she has a fat ass. I want an apology. Uh, hello? Uh, may I speak to the, uh, 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 t uh, toilet bowl people? <laughs> toilet bowl people? Hey, 
Uh, uh, hello? Hello, is this, uh, is this the toilet, uh, uh, is this the toilet bowl person in, in charge? Uh, yeah, well, uh, I'm calling for Miss, uh, I'm calling for, uh, Lyle Harris's daughter, Miss Harris. I'm calling for Miss Harris. Yes, I'm her manager, and, uh, I hear, I understand that you've, uh, asked her to audition for some commercials, and, uh, well, I'm, uh, well, first of all, Miss Harris doesn't audition for a job. You either take her or you don't. And secondly, I'm not sure I like the association with toilet bowl cleaners. I'm not too sure. Sorry, I'm not talking too much. I'm I mean her image. getting into this movie. This is the first time I've ever done anything like this. I don't know. I guess the idea is that you're supposed to just be talking throughout the whole thing. I don't know, man. I've, I've seen some of these videos. Watch alongs. And... I don't know. A lot of it is just a lot of bullshit, if you ask me. People. <clears throat> it's people saying stuff just to say it at a certain point, but better financially and that the exposure would be greater. You're out of your mind. Look, now can we go get something to eat? Dress like this? I don't know where they're gonna go eat, but you don't look too bad. I mean you dummy. Some great Pittsburgh locations here. It's always reminded me of this scene from uh, Austin Powers. <laughs> it's almost like a. Uh, which Austin, I think is the second Austin Powers where they're they go shopping or whatever. I guess it was a thing in a lot of movies back then. It was a scene where people go shopping. I don't know. all came to a head with Dawn of the Dead. Shopping didn't look so fun after the movie. <clears throat> what do you think they'll find on the moon? You like Italian food? Chinese food? Did anybody ever buy anything because of a television commercial? Have you ever been to a cat house? Do you still go to church? Are you a virgin? How many girls have you made it with? <laughs> That shot, you could actually see the boom mic. On a roller coaster. You know what I mean? Oh. <laughs> hey. What's your name? What's yours? Where are you from? Where'd you go after that? Now, George, when it was in interviews, uh, when asked about this, so he said it was kind of, he was kind of trying to be something that he wasn't. Uh, which, I mean, you can see a lot of George's style in this movie, just in terms of the, uh, the cutting, the editing. Um, which I, that's yeah, to me, if I can get up on a little bit of a sidetrack here, or Romero as an editor is the best I Romero, know, in my don't. opinion. I mean, What's we all know him as a director, know, we all know him as a writer, um, but the period happens. from you know, Night of the Living Dead to you know, the late Image days, uh, all the way up until uh, and Creep Show, I think he did uh, the editing for uh, something that tied you over in that. Um, I just love Romero as an editor. Uh, I, I just, I think that's his strong point. Um, I mean, God, just look at Night Riders, Dawn of the Dead, um, Martin, the Crazies. Perfect example of Romero as an editor. I've, I've wanted to do a video or something on uh, on Romero the editor. Um, I just think that's where he shines. That's where you see his. You, that's where you see the most Romero is in his editing. Uh, more so than his direction or his writing. <clears throat> you see a lot of that in this. Um, maybe not so much in content or, um, you know, the, the, the dialogue. Because, um, I mean, this is just an anomaly. I mean, this is really unlike anything else Romero ever did, um, just in terms of content, but... Um, you know, his editing style is there. Um, and I think Romero's actually even said that um, before, that he, he looks at there's always Vanilla as more of a movie that he edited more so than directed. He doesn't really... Uh, and I, I completely agree with him. 
a lot of quick cutting. Um, the pace and, and the uh, the tension of the film set in the uh, in the cutting and the editing. Um, I don't know. I just I just love I just love his work as an editor. I wish he would have done more, um, you know, later. But I mean, Romero was old school, man. I've been in town over twenty four. Cut on film. And I'm still just arriving. Just messing around doing nothing. I couldn't imagine. I don't, I don't know. I couldn't imagine uh, George, um, you know, booting up Final Cut or something like that. You know. I think it's great to be that way. I think he'd just look at that and just. Shake his head. And... There's a mission down the road. You can get a clean bed and a bowl of soup. <laughs> now it's getting good. a survey on the sexual habits of young unmarried females. <laughs> You're going to give me a reputation. Well, so what? What's wrong with a reputation? Without a reputation, you're nothing. You know, that's what's wrong with the world. People don't devote enough time to giving themselves reputations. I don't think it's so bad. I don't know what that means. I didn't say anything. But you think I think the one of the more, more tragic well, things about Ray uh, Ray Lane's character in this. Just to get a little feel. So I mean, I'm mm -hmm. well, glass and a half wine in. This is going to get worse as it goes, folks. So if uh, I done that. <laughs> if you've had enough, tune out now because it ain't getting any better. Um. <clears throat> But the, the, I think the tragic thing about Ray Lane's character in this movie is he's a you know, smooth, good-looking, you know, well, slick-talking well, guy, uh, bagging ladies, you know, help. knocking up broads, I guess. <laughs> always got, crazy. always got, you know, some philosophical thing to say. You know, he's always got the answer. He's he's got this, he's got that. But oh, you gotta be kidding me. But the real world like just just. He he just can't uh, he just can't navigate his own issues and problems. Never mind, you know that's 100 percent me. Um, my 20s, teens, hell, probably now. You ask me again in 10 years, I'll say my 30s, I guess. But uh, <clears throat> I think it's a lot of people. We all have the uh, answers. The uh, to solve the world's problems, but uh, we struggle to solve our own small problems. But, but I guess that's the beauty of being young. Somebody has to sell little plastic aircraft carriers. Just him running away from his responsibilities like his child. You, know, you see a guy like this, you're like, man, he's got confidence, you know, he's got the uh, <clears throat> slick tongue devil. Chris, why do you want me? But you know, all I could ever come up with was you're a hell of a beautiful lady, and she was a hell of a beautiful lady, but that's not enough to I love you. Well, 
That's kind of understandable, isn't it? Yeah, well, I dug her. I mean, there was something, there was a certain part of Lynn. This is a really good performance by Ray Lane, though, man, I gotta say. Really understand it. I, I, I could never figure it out. I couldn't tell her. Chris. He's a guy who doesn't seem like he's ever been 100% honest with himself or almost any person that he's come in contact with, including his father, his baby mama, and now poor old Lynn Harris here. I still don't have it clear. I still can't figure out why the whole thing happened. I can identify with some of that. I can identify with some of that. I'm not sure who this voice is. Sounds familiar. But I don't know who this uh, radio broadcast voice is. <laughs> the Arrogant Pigeons. That's a good band name. Copyright. Punk band. Well, I frighten them. Uh, if, they, if they don't move, I, uh, I swing my feet and I give them a healthy kick. Well, I walk along now, the street when they so see me coming, they move out of the way. Sounds like uh, uh, Vince Servinsky. driving down the street. They won't even move out of the way. And I just, sometimes I get so doggone mad that I just drive for them, right for them. Well, then you've sounded Yeah, I think that's 100% Vince Servinsky. I know, but it, when you're driving it would take a there. year to kill them all, all by myself. <laughs> I want that poster. Uh, that would be a really awesome uh, poster or print or whatever the hell you want to call it. There's like five people on Earth who would buy it, but I would definitely be one of them. See the other side in the other room. Now, wait a minute before you vilify me further. See what I've brought in from the West. The finest in exotic food and drink, a veritable treasure trove of palatable perfection. Even got a little dope. You're kidding. Yeah, I'm only kidding you. Some grass. That's it. That is grass, lady. Good grass. It's crazy to think how far we've come as a uh, as a people uh, when it comes to <laughs> to grass. I've never seen it loose before. It's like you, like she's talking about a uh, you know pure uncut cocaine or something. Bought it. You are not a very trusting person. A liar and a not very trusting person. What are you writing? My first novel. What's it about? Nothing. Nothing? And everything. Everything and nothing. Well, it isn't about anything. It is something. Then what is it? It's a book. It's a book. Book will have a cover. God damn, this sounds like me. This is a daily conversation between me and, and uh and my girlfriend almost on a daily basis. Hey, I'm gonna do this, man. I'm gonna do this. Where'd you get the grass? Oh well you realize, man, I'm gonna I gotta get gifts in the morning. Oh, I know that's not true. Mr. Straight. Oh, Mr. Spade lives next door? Mm hmm. Yeah, I always wondered where Mr. Spade lived. He lives next door. And boy, is he a turn off. Oh, yeah. No. Oh, that's right. You know 
don't sleep with anybody. Speaking of grass, you are very That's right. But you gotta admit, it's a productive kind of rudeness. <laughs> Keeps things in perspective. <clears throat> I'm glad you're still here. This is what they would call a talkie back in the day. Another commercial. Oh, that's weird. An aluminum fry pan. Mm. Wait a minute. You gotta set the mood. Light some incense. Play some tool. Now take a deep drag and hold Go it. Go on, girl. This. Now maybe this will explain it to you. Now hold it in really deep. As long as you can. Side it, cigarettes, huh? I don't know if Lynn was really into it or if she was just behaving the way she thought I wanted her to behave. Or what? I don't know. I don't know if the girl was stoned or not. Did you see on the beach? Hmm? On the beach, the movie. Hmm. There's a scene in there that reminds me of this. There were these two people. I think they were married. Yeah, they were married because they had a child. <laughs> they had to kill the child. <laughs> they had to kill it. Yeah. Well, everyone was dying of radiation anyway. I like that <laughs> laugh there. She doesn't know that he has a kid. And so they got all touched. It's just it's such a good pills with their teeth. Like juxtaposition of where these two people that come from. This? They come from just two yeah. completely yeah. different backgrounds. I mean, you, no. they kind of point that out earlier and then they're doing no, the questioning. Uh, See, <clears throat> they got all tucked in she's like, how many how many women have you made it with? He asks, you know you're still religious, you know, that type of thing. She thinks that all married people, or all people that have kids are married. And uh, I can testify that that's not, not true. And he knows that as well. So they do everything they do um, this is a pretty well written movie you know, for it. I mean god the budget was I think the, you know they probably spent uh, the same amount of money on this movie as the uh, catering budget for uh, you know for, for creep show or something inside my head a lot of it's wrapped up inside there but why do I have to keep spending time trying to figure out why and telling people why and why do I have to uh, they have a reason for the whole it's definitely thing. not a movie for I everybody. Know why it happened. Yeah. Why? Because you're silly. And you're cute. Cute? I think you're cute. This is weird dialogue. And you're on. But relatable. About everything. I think that's the most important thing. I don't think I've ever met anyone like you. People just aren't like that. And it should be the easiest thing in the world. I wonder why it isn't. Maybe it is. It just seems right. It's because it wasn't deliberate. Hmm? We didn't know what was going to happen. That's why I can be honest. They're just on two different levels, man. Creepy. <laughs> what the hell is he doing? I just get so sick of it sometimes. 
standing around day after day turning this Okay, so this is interesting. Not really. But it's interesting to me. <clears throat> the uh I did a video earlier this week about a photograph uh, that I purchased eight by ten. Uh apparently original photograph. Um I did a video on it, um, got some feedback on it. Um, Eric Kent from the Garf Network um, helped me identify that that photograph was from this scene right here, behind the scenes um, photo from that. Uh, this shot here, almost exactly, I believe. Uh, I think George was shooting this. I gave perfect dinner parties. I made perfect small talk. So, yeah, it was pretty cool to find out. Um, which, I don't know why. I've seen this movie, God, 20, 30 times, at least. Completely blanked on this scene. Uh, I mean, it's not an important scene. It's not, you know... I think it is the only scene with uh, with that character, her mother. And I think this actress does a fantastic job. Um, I had her name the other day. I can't remember what her name is. Eleanor something. Eleanor... Uh, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, but she does a fantastic job in this scene. I really enjoy it. I really like that scene. Um, but yeah, so just the pretty cool little story there. Little scene, but... No, now they're getting, getting on each other's nerves. So I'm guessing this kind of takes a... The timeline in this is a little funky. Um... It seems like they jump ahead quite a few, you know, months at this point. Anybody that's been in a relationship, they know these periods. You know, you have your the honeymoon period. Your, you know, fuck, I'm tired of listening to you. Period. Then they have their, you know, this is they're in their fuck, I'm tired of listening to you. Period. Yeah, at this point. Watching you stare at that typewriter and stare at that television, waiting for you to figure out what you want to do. Well, what are you going to do, Chris? I'm pregnant. Damn. <clears throat> Oops, you did it again. God damn, I got another one pregnant. <laughs> that dude was he was fucked for a second hello there lay it on the line all right this is the bottle folks who are you, who are you calling sir who are you calling who are you calling hello hello what are we gonna sit here all day and say hello to you i love trying to guess who these voices are on the line sir I wake up in the morning, and I say to Lynn, it's too early to me why you locked me out of your room last night. And she comes up with some kind of crazy-ass excuse of, my mother's coming today. So, I can't sleep with you last night because your mother's coming today. Just the way she said it. It'd be like cheating her. Exactly. It's like cheating her. You'll have to get all of your things out of here today. Well, I haven't touched you in three weeks. It's been three days. It might as well be three weeks. Love that look. Freeland's such a good actor, no, man. We gone way too soon, man. We didn't see enough of him. I don't know if I could see him as Roger and Don. That's really hard to imagine. It would have been a completely different character, but I think he could have pulled it off. Um, I 
I don't know, seeing him run there, probably not. I guess after, because he was in uh, Jack's Wife as well, Season of the Witch. He was in that as well, uh, really good in that, and then never never appeared in another Romero film. Why do you keep um, coming back like this? I mean, what does it do for you coming back here? And as everybody knows, Romero, during this time period, pretty much casted. Um, Makes me a daddy. He says many times, casted. Based on uh, who's the best actor amongst his friends. Like um, in, uh... So I'm guessing at this point he, he probably you moved on to, uh, you know, probably went out to Hollywood trying to make it, uh, trying to make it big. Never did. Uh, I need, I gotta, I gotta look up uh, and learn more on Ray Lane, man. Um, Is he my kid, Terry? John Ample speaks very highly of him. But I'm not sure. Nice snap carpets. Scene nine, take three, sound three. Action. I love the stuff here with the commercials. It's just weird. Especially during this time, I mean, we should go with that original idea we had pulling the curtain back on commercials like that. Michael. <laughs> what a weird. <laughs> what a weird guy. Quiet, please. Nice nap carpet, scene nine. Fifth Avenue. Better than Butterfinger. Wouldn't you really love to live in the Okay, one more time. You moved your eyes. Keep your eyes right on. Wouldn't you really love to lay one in your floor? Okay, camera. Four and a half seconds. Sounds good. Okay, that's safe. Now that's Rudy Ritchie right there. Sorry, guys. I just saw this Fifth Avenue sitting over here, and I just couldn't help myself. So is this. All right, here we go again. Call me tomorrow. Quiet, please. That is actually their front door. Here. <clears throat> Shazam. 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 All right. Now that's not the Monrovo Mall. I'm not exactly sure what uh, mall that's at. Butchers and bakers, candlestick makers. Do you know a tribe of Indians that needs a good Indian chief? She is a hundred percent sick of hearing his shit. You know, I think I would make one hell of a good Indian chief. Cool, bro. Can you help me with these groceries? <laughs> Height. Five nine. Weight. One hundred fifty-five. Eyes. Thirty brown. Black. Thirty brown. Well, can't you just write down black? What the hell are they here? Eyes. Single. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell do they care, eyes? What? What do you intend to do with the next 50 or 60 years of your life? 
Hey, I'm sorry, Lynn, but I'm gonna have to waste three hours of your life. Chris! Now, wait a minute. God, this guy. I got a job. Well, I have an interview for a job. Sounds just like him. Why they wouldn't give it to me? Because I am magnificent. Come on, let's go to bed. Chris? Come on. Where? Well, in the bedroom. Where else? What kind of job? Where? A very good job. Definitely a young me. Younger me. Pierce Burns and Manspeaker. Do you have an interview? With Mr. Manspeaker himself. Chris, that's one of the biggest agencies. Oh. And now they're going to have a copywriter who can write good. Well. Chris, you just can't walk into a place like that and expect to get a job because you think you can do it better than anyone else. You can't do it. You need experience. Be sensible. Hey, Lynn, wait a minute. What the hell is this? Now, I don't want to go to school for four years. Now, you tell me what the hell is sensible. My guitar, is that sensible? Look, I got a good shot at this job, and I can do it. I'm surprised they'd even let you in the door. Sorry, I'm lost in this scene right now. It's such a crazy, messy Don't movie. Um, oh, Jesus Christ, what the hell is bugging you? But it's good. It's good stuff. You're a bitch. See you. You were referred to us by uh, Lyle Harris. This is a great scene. That's Lyle Harris, the newscaster. That's right. That's a pretty good reference. Very good reference. This is how everybody, that, if uh, anybody that goes for a uh, a job interview of any type, this is how everybody has it in their head. Everybody imagines that it, how, this is how it's going to go. I'm just going to be like, yeah, well, blah, blah, blah. You know, I can be the CEO of Amazon. What do you mean? I'm selling myself to you right now, and I'm succeeding. What makes you think you're succeeding? Your pupils. Pupils? Pupils. Your pupils have expanded since we've been talking. Your emotional response to me is positive. I wouldn't recommend trying this uh, technique at job interviews, but... Okay, try it. See what happens. This is a young I did that one time, kind of, at a job interview. Because it was a job that I didn't really need at the time. I had a job. Uh, but just kind of see what my options were. So I went in with nothing to lose. You see, I feel as though a pimp... And they apparently wanted to be really bad after the interview. And I was just like, I don't know. both deal with the public in the same way. So this technique does work sometimes. A solution to frustrations, a fulfillment of desires. Because this guy really doesn't care if he gets the job or not. The other with the new deodorant, toilet bowl cleaner. Yeah, well, that's one way of putting it. Yes, that's one hell of a way of putting it. Harry, you'll have to admit that's one hell of a way of putting it. I'll have to talk to Bill and see if this will fit into our triple treat philosophy. Triple treat. Our agency philosophy. I treat in the product. I treat in the message. Tailored to treat a target audience. I think that can wait, Ralph. Also, I'd like to have a few words with Chris alone, if oh, you don't mind. Sure. <clears throat> this is definitely a statement um, uh, from George on dealing with uh, the ad executive types, I'm sure, around this time. All the commercials he was uh, doing, all the uh, probably all the assholes he had to deal with at this time. Like this, uh, <laughs> like this stooge here. Definitely, definitely a commentary on weird uh, secretary executive relationship. I don't know. Man. See, that's what the hell is wrong with everything. I'm a bottle of wine in. 
<laughs> it ain't getting any better, yeah, folks. How can I uh, place any kind of value on a thing like that? I went in there and told <sighs> those people all kinds of horse shit, and they offered me a job. Chris, I'm an idiot. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> I'm an idiot and a child, and I'm sorry. I don't want to screw things up. I don't want to screw things up for you. Hey, Lynn, that's not the hit. That's not the hit at all. It's not you, it's me. Uh, you're not forcing me into doing anything I don't want to do. I want to do it. I knew it before I met you. I was going to have to get... get into a new thing. I knew I was going to have to get a new thing together. Maybe all I needed was to get up off my dead ass to finally do something. I'll tell you why I came back here. I might have a kid. I might be a father. I don't know. It's it's just some girl I used to. It's interesting. You can't even own up to the fact that it is his. I'll tell you the truth, I, I I couldn't tell you how she took it. He knows it's his, or it's not. It's not a. He must be He wouldn't feel guilty about it. Explain to you what the reaction was. There was like a, uh, a no reaction. Now this sound here, I remember hearing this sound uh, first time we visited Pittsburgh. We uh, took I don't did it's the lift, you know, the lift, that, you know. Remember we got on, what is it, what is it called, Duquesne lift, something like that. Whatever we got on it, and as soon as I heard this sound, I knew, wait a minute, that's from, there's always vanilla, it sounds exactly, his name's Chris. Uh, oh, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible. That's it right there. It still exists, it's still there in Pittsburgh, you ride it to this day, and it sounds the exact same as it does in this movie. There, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. So I said, man, um, it's one thing about this movie. That's where it comes out. I mean, it all looks very similar. Still, I mean, this is what, 50 years later? This is a 50-year-old movie. That's the beautiful thing about, uh, about Pittsburgh, man. A lot of it still looks the same. But it's not, you know... I don't know what I'm trying to say, but <clears throat> I guess I'm trying to say go visit Pittsburgh if you get a chance. If you're a fan of Romero and his films, um, you'll feel like you've been there before. That's all I'll say. Where are you aware? Can I take your order? No, I'd like a check. I have to make a few phone calls. Man, dealing with a subject like that 1971 uh, abortion. Uh, and the abortion. Uh, the whole sequence coming up here with George Casana. Um, it's one of the. It's a really. Uh, you were in the service, weren't you, Chris? That's why we've chosen uh, this army. I don't know what I'm looking for. Uncomfortable scene. Um, uh, that, that Romero's ever done. Still pretty, uh, pretty effective. George Casana is super. Um, Super creepy in this. He did, he plays it really really well. Uh, strangely, because I don't think he was like necessarily like an actor. You know, he was more just like a local guy who came out for. Uh... I could be wrong about that. I don't know. I'm just talking at this point. But Cassandra does a good job in this. Hey, Chris. 
Here's the whole ball of wax. Good luck, son. Oh, and remember, a treat in the product, a treat in the message, tailored to treat a target audience. <laughs> There's so many just like little touches in these early movies. I mean, it's just stuff that budget. I could go on about big budget movies, little, you know, small budget movies, the things that make small budget movies great and the things that make big budget movies bad. I, I could go into all that. I could spend a lot of time on that. I'm not going to do that, but. The thing that separates great filmmakers from bad filmmakers, or even good filmmakers, just those little, little details, Sorry. you know, stuff that doesn't cause doesn't cost a penny, but you get so much more out of it. I mean, George was just brilliant about that. Getting the mo I mean, you look at you you look at like Dawn of the Dead. You, Think of what that budget would be today to do what they did. Um, just incredible. I and mean, he did that through all of his movies, all of his films throughout his entire career. Um, but it's just those little details that, that guys like Romero and Carpenter, um, those little details that they throw in that they see that they say okay this will work and a lot of it is just it's a lot of it is Romero's uh, willingness to collaborate I'm sure a lot of this stuff is just little stuff here and there that the actors want to throw in and a lot of directors sometimes would say uh, no stick to the script um, you know they're Kubrickian in that way I guess you could say where everything is director's vision and that's you know final yeah, a little input here and there from certain people that you trust, um, you know, your, your closest confidants on your crew, actors that you've worked with over and over and over again. But Romero would listen to suggestions and ideas from anybody. Um, and I think that just that, that added that, that fabric, uh, it was woven into that fabric of, of Romero's films over that time period from 68 to, uh, I'd, I'd probably go... All the way up to Creepshow, and that's when I think it started to uh, lessen a little bit. But even Creepshow, I mean, there's still a lot of collaboration there. Um, especially with, I mean, that's why him and Tom work so well. Um, because George was open to anything Tom wanted to do, and Tom was willing to, to give. Um, and I think that's why those two work so well. But you know, but even for like movies like this, I mean, geez. I'm sure if Ray Lane had an idea for his character for just a little small thing, you know, uh, George would listen. Um, and he'd let, let people try things, you know. And some may look at that as a weakness as a director, but, you know. There's the Stanley Kubrick, which I love Kubrick. I think he's, to me... You know, Jesus, I wish I could possibly the greatest, the best director of all time. Not my favorite. Um, he's up there, but in terms of just objective, objectively looking at it, Kubrick is probably the best. Um, but he, you know, him and George have completely different ways of doing things. Uh, I'm just preaching at this point. I'm almost out of wine, so we're up to this great scene, this great sequence here. So I'm going to shut up and. Uh, Let's watch it. And I just one night just tore it. She was supposed to come back from some gig she had. No. George Cassano is coming up. Of course, the sheriff from Night of the Living Dead. I loved his performance in this. Just really watch, pay attention to just the, the natural delivery that he has to it. I mean, it's just, uh, does, does a great job. Like I said, for a guy that's not Robert De Niro or something, you know. Not even a character actor, you couldn't even call him. It's him right there. Okay. You had anything neat for the last 12 hours? No. That's good. Try to relax. 
You're probably a little nervous. You're gonna have a little miscarriage. Have a drink. Take one drink. I don't want to means you. nothing to him. He, I'm sure he's done this plenty of times before. It's almost like a cop reading someone their uh, their Miranda rights. Some blood. It's only natural. It happens every time. You follow instructions, do what the man says, everything's fine. He's going to put you up on a table. He's going to reach inside. He's going to make a little hole. About a week or so later, you're going to have a little miscarriage. You don't do what you're told. You've got problems. You understand? And this guy's so evil. I mean, it's, it's, he, now it's going to take us about a half hour. This delivery there, there's, uh, there's no soul to it whatsoever, man. No heart. He's there to do a job. They make, they really make uh, these back alley abortions, which <laughs> really make it seem, which is pretty awesome in a way when you think about it. George, you know, eventually became known as a horror filmmaker at, you know, in his career. But at this time, he, I mean, that's one of the reasons he wanted to make There's Always Vanilla in, in the first place. Uh, he wanted to do it. Um, he didn't want to get pigeonholed. Um, it's just a horror guy. Um, but even in this, you still see horror elements. I mean, it's just... Sit that's down, George. Right. I'll just be a moment. Would you care for a shot of whiskey? I already gave her one. No, I'm not sure who this guy is. He looks familiar. You know, I think the greatest crime in the world is... I like that this doctor's just getting boozed up before performing this. And this is the most... <laughs> Up on the towel, please. And really, I mean, it goes to show you, I mean, geez... I don't get the whole abortion thing. I don't really have an opinion on it one way or the other, to be honest with you, but he's selling the idea of, like, man, these back alley abortions are, are not cool, not fun. It's not a good option to have, man. The rub man, the heartbreaking thing about that too. He's he's given up. He's just like, man, I think the relationship's over, I'm out. She's going through this hell for him. And then he'll be gone by the time she she gets home. It's just used as a guide. Nothing to worry about. He thinks she's out uh cheating. But she's actually just getting an abortion. That reminds me of the uh, shot from the cans cut of uh, <laughs> Dawn of the Dead. Stephen's typing. What the hell is he doing? I don't know. I don't understand why he's chasing her out of the room. I don't. She just don't want to do it. I guess maybe I don't know. Unless she hasn't paid him yet, I have no idea. All I know is I wouldn't want to get a uh, back alley abortion. Take that as a lesson, ladies. If you get a back alley abortion, you may end up being chased by George Casana. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Door is open. This is like the scene from American Psycho. Yeah. Oh, you look 
looking for the girl. Terry. Moved out. Oh, yeah? You don't know where, do you? No, the landlord might. Oh, yeah. Coming up on the end of this, I want to pre. Uh, just want to say I appreciate anybody checking this out. Um, pretty new to this stuff. Just something I wanted to try, give a shot. Never done a watch along or really any YouTube videos hardly ever before. Um, but a lot of this I just kind of want to do for myself, just to kind of. Record my thoughts, I guess. I don't know. Well, who would I talk to about something like that? Well, let me talk to him then. What are you doing? I'm calling the police. The fuzz? I thought they were just a bunch of fascist pigs. You know what that is? Yeah, maybe you should call Fidel Castro, bitch. Chris! What the hell are you doing up in that tree? Don't yell at him. He probably has his reasons. Life moves in subtle ways. Get down out of that tree. Don't talk to him like that. Deep. He's not a little boy anymore. Then what's he doing up in that tree? You have no idea where she went. Well, I guess I could find out. I don't know. You should let me handle the whole thing. But seriously, I appreciate everybody. Uh, anybody checking this out? I called my lawyer. I could have could have had that whole mess straightened out. You're just too damn stubborn. You know, being a man means that you're ready to take advice oh, from somebody. What the hell does being a man have to do with letting you handle my problem? Well, I'm not about to stake you to three more years of trying to figure them out for yourself. It's not a stake. It's a loan. Where's my collateral? Well, as long as I keep bumming around on a no-good, hippie, dirty communist circuit, you're always as short of a piece of ass when I'm in town. Wait a minute now, your mother won't What the hell? Let her know you're a man, too. Been ignoring no, that minute, fact for the last 15 years. That's about enough. That's about enough of that. I do really enjoy the chemistry between Ray Lane and uh, Roger Dad. McGovern. McGovern does a fantastic Dad, job don't in this. And I don't want to sell vacuum cleaners. And I don't want to sell little toy plastic aircraft carriers. And I don't want to... I don't know what it's I'm me in my 20s. 100%. Chris, I think I understand what you're talking about. A little bit, anyway. Listen to this. A little bit like going to Howard Johnson's for ice cream. You can get all kinds of wild, exotic flavors, but somehow you always wind up with vanilla. Oh, Jesus Christ, Dad, I could cry. But you get what I mean? Yeah, I don't see how that Listen, is. all you have to do is occasionally, like, just once in a while, listen yeah. to what no, wait, there has no, to be hold something on. Now, just a minute, your... hey, Dad. But how about the poor bastard that gets hung up on butter pecan? You're disappointed when he can't get it. There's always vanilla, Chris. Always vanilla. That's what it comes down to, huh? If you get what I mean. It's a very important line. Um, There's always definitely hit me the first time I heard it. I think the first time I saw this movie, um, thinks bold. Acts bold. 17, 18 years old. Always stood out. I think my sound went out, but there's some bitches on most of our two minutes left. Bold gold. Frumpy little chick with your brains in your ass. You have spinach in your teeth. I think my TV or uh, computer's starting to collapse. 
That's weird. No, I got audio in. But oh, we're kind of on the end of the movie. End of the film. Well, tell us about your putts. <laughs> she looks familiar. I can't quite tell off that. But... It's a good film. Good movie. I can see how it could have gained George's appreciation. And like I said, the better quality these films get over time, the, the more it's easy to appreciate them. They're, you're not being distracted by, you know, the uh, the aging of the release. There's Vince Servinsky. Dude always seems to uh, show up at the end of these Romero films. What the hell is this? But yeah, this is definitely a one-of-a-kind Romero film. I don't think you ever really did anything quite like it uh, ever again. Would have liked to have seen something, you know, um, something else. Maybe a little more budget. Um, and Lord knows, I'm sure he tried, but unless it had the dead coming back to life, and it wasn't going to get made. I don't know how the hell he got Bruiser made. But after that, it's just like... Burp. No zombies. No can do. Canvas film. And that's the end of this one, folks. I think Canvas also... Uh, I think they also worked with George. I don't know if it's the crazies. Season of Witch. I don't know at this point. Um, but yeah. That's There's Always Vanilla. Yeah. Flaws. The biggest flaws in this film. Easily. Uh, just budgetary. Uh, if they had more time, more money. Um, I'm sure they could have fleshed that out. Made it more than it was. I don't know if it really needed to be more than it was. Um. Let me turn this off. It's very distracting. Okay. I don't know if it really needed to be anything more than what it was, on, to be honest with you. Um, at this point, I mean, it was George's second film after Night of the Living Dead. Um, do you want to try something new? Did something new? You know, like I said, it's not for everybody, um, especially if you're a, a George fan. Um uh, it's dead films or you know Martin creep show those types um I can understand why some people wouldn't like it um but you know like I said it's always been a personal favorite of mine it's, it's something completely different and um I don't know I've always enjoyed it um and I hope you did too um but I'm gonna get off here I'm gonna finish up the rest of my wine and uh, I'm gonna Call it a stream. Um, so, yeah. I appreciate it. I'll probably do another one of these here soon. Um, you know, I just put up the uh, Tom Savini Christian uh, Stravakis commentary for Dawn of the Dead. Um, released only in the UK um, before this. But now, if you're in the US, you can hear it as well. It's great. It's, um, it's like that time when uh, audio commentaries were uh, lawless and fun and free. And, I mean, it's a great commentary. It's really entertaining. Check it out if you get a chance. Um, like, subscribe. That's what everybody says um, on YouTube. I watch a lot of YouTube videos, and everybody seems to want you to like and subscribe. So I guess you should like and subscribe. Um but yeah, that's There's Always Vanilla, 1971, George A. Romero, his second film. Uh, I'll probably do another watch along um, here at some point. If you have any ideas, let me know. Um, but until that time, I appreciate it. Uh, you guys checking this out. Uh, have a great rest of the night, and I'll catch up with you guys.
I don't know, whenever the hell I want to do this again. So, there's that. Peace.